Hello, Keith Kaiser here with our final installment of Luke's Life of Christ, our series where we've been teaching verse by verse through the gospel according to Luke. We come to Luke 24 and verse 50 today. Luke 24 and verse 50. And it says there, And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now it came to pass while he blessed them that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. And this is speaking about the Lord's final acts with the disciples. And each of the Gospels gives us different emphases of what the Lord did before he went back to heaven. Obviously, he did a number of things. And not any one of them is identical in their emphasis. They each point to different things. Matthew, for example, gives us the great commission to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them whatsoever things that the Lord had commanded them, and then promising his abiding presence, he says, and lo, I am with you even unto the end of the age. Uh, the end of the Gospel of John has sort of an epilogue where the Lord meets with the disciples on the beach and uh, very definitely restores them and lays out the future ministry that the apostles Peter and John and the others would have for him. Mark is much like uh, Matthew, but more succinctly, the Lord is saying, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, and gives a little summary, uh, we might call it a preview, of the description of what the church would do after the Lord Jesus Christ had ascended back to heaven, and summarizes a lot of the things we see in the book of Acts. And of course, here in Luke, uh, we see the Lord taking them out as far as Bethany, and he's going to act in priestly fashion towards them. Now, again, it's uh, interesting to see that the Lord is leading them, and that is what the church looks to. We look to the Lord Jesus Christ as our head. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, then he is your head and your master. He's your God. Uh, that, of course, requires worship and praise, but it also requires obedience. It means that we've been saved to submit to his authority and to serve him and to do his will. And so we follow him at his leading. But in any case, uh, here uh, we see that he's leading them. And he comes out to the familiar area of Bethany, hometown of his dear friends, Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And oftentimes he had spent refreshing seasons with them in their house. And it was sort of a home away from home for the Lord. And pretty much a base of operations when he was near Jerusalem. Bethany is very close to the city of Jerusalem. And of course, who could forget that in John 11, it's the scene where the Lord revealed himself as the resurrection and the life, one of his great I am statements, because he raised his friend Lazarus from the dead. And uh, now the Lord is taking the disciples out as far as Bethany, and he lifts up his hands and he blesses them. Now, I say this is a priestly action. This is the benedictory type of uh, gesture of raising one's hands and blessing another. And we see Melchizedek doing it toward Abraham, for example, in Genesis 14. And Hebrews explains that the less is blessed by the better. That, in other words, someone greater in dignity and rank blesses someone who is lesser in dignity and rank. And so, it shows the supremacy of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he is blessing his people. Uh, one of our hymn writers talks about the contrasts of his ministry on earth before the cross and uh, leading up to the cross. And he says in this line of the hymn, Blesser yet a curse once made. That's the extraordinary thing, that the Lord, who is the source of all blessing, the one who Ephesians 1 says, blesses us with all spiritual blessings, that one himself was made a curse for us. And Galatians 3 unpacks that truth with great detail, particularly in verses 10 through 13, which you can consult at your leisure. But here the Lord is blessing his people, and it is not sort of an empty gesture. One can think about 1 Samuel 1, where Hannah is there praying before the Lord, pouring out her grief and her heart's care. And the high priest in those days was not a spiritual or a discerning man, Eli. And uh, unfortunately, he mistakes her for a drunken woman. And instead of comforting her, he reproves her. And then he finds out his mistake. And so he adds a cursory blessing to her. Now, 
as she received that blessing in good humor, she took it as from the Lord. In other words, she looked at him in his position as high priest. And even when the high priest was not a good high priest, the Lord would use uh, these offices in Israel, would use the position. And we can think of how similarly Caiaphas, who was a rank unbeliever and a wicked high priest in John chapter 11, is the one who said that you know nothing at all, that it's expedient that one man die for the people. He was talking about political expediency. He was talking about protecting the Sadducean control of the temple complex and the religious life of Israel and their clout in the society. And if they let Jesus go on, it might result in a revolt and the Romans would come away and take their place and their power. So he wasn't speaking at all spiritually. And yet the Spirit of God turned his words to have a wonderful prophetic double entendre. In other words, they had a, another significance that he didn't perceive. Yes, it was expedient that one man die for the people. The substitutionary atonement of our Lord Jesus Christ, the fact that he would become the redeemer and the redemption payment, the one who paid to set us free from the slavery of sin and from its guilt and penalty and ultimately from its presence, but also the redemption payment. He's the redemption that has been paid by the sacrifice of himself, a propitiation, a sacrifice that satisfies God in respect to justice and holiness. So God has not made himself spiritually unclean or dirtied himself. God is holy and God has shown his righteousness and yet he provides a righteous way to extend his mercy and grace to sinners that he doesn't judge us and gives us salvation through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. For those who know the Lord Jesus Christ, they come under the benefit of the mercy and grace of God. They can say, saved, and uh, they can say, glory, I'm saved, as the hymn says, glory, I'm saved. My sins are all pardoned, my guilt is all gone. Well, that's open to you, my friend. If you don't know the Savior today, he stands ready and willing to save you, and he certainly wants to bless you. Now, let's not mistake what that blessing is. Blessing doesn't mean no problems on this earth, because as we'll see in the book of Acts, when we do uh, studies in the book of Acts, which is coming next on this channel, we'll find out that the church had to suffer a lot of things. We'll find out that in Acts 14, Paul would tell the early converts, it's through many tribulations that you must enter the kingdom. So we can't expect health and wealth and waveless seas in this scene right now. We're living in a fallen world, uh, a place where death and the curse are endemic, and yet it's on borrowed time because the Lord has already defeated death. The Lord has already made a way that the curse is vanquished and that blessing is going to extend. One of our Christmas hymns that we sing says in Joy to the World, he comes to make his blessings known far as the curse is found. And so when the Lord comes back, to rule and reign on this earth over what we call the millennium or the millennial kingdom, there's going to be an extent of blessing that's never been seen before in world history. So blessing doesn't mean our best life now or peace and safety now. If you hear somebody saying peace and safety, 1 Thessalonians 5, then sudden destruction comes upon them, it says. And so that's a false doctrine. That's the uh, false peace that Satan would have people lulled into complacency. We're not going to enjoy peace in this world. We're going to suffer for the Lord Jesus' sake. We're going to be persecuted as he was persecuted. Yea, all who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, 2 Timothy 3.12 says. And the Lord said, if they've persecuted me, your Lord and Master, they'll do the same unto you. And so uh, we have to be aware that the blessing doesn't mean temporal blessing, blessing in the here and now, or material blessing. I mean, every material blessing that we get certainly is from the Lord. Every day we have, every breath, every heartbeat, every thought is on loan to us, as it were, from God. It's by his providence that we live. In him we live and move and have our being, Acts 17 says. But we have to understand the blessing that God is ultimately moving us toward is eternal blessing blessing that is in the world to come, the age to come, as the Bible calls it, in the Father's house and in the new heavens and new earth, wherein dwells righteousness, according to Second Peter 3. So the Lord blesses them, and indeed, to know the Lord is to be blessed above anything we could have in this world. It's far better to know the Lord 
than to have the best of this world. We might be a pauper in this world, or we might be middle class, or we might be wealthy. It doesn't really matter. But our blessing lies not in our possessions or in our physical state. It lies in our position in Christ. It lies in the fact that we know God through his Son and that he sees us as united to that Son, that our life is hid with Christ in God, as Colossians 3 says. And so our blessing comes from knowing Christ. And uh, we can say, Every joy or trial falleth from above, traced upon our dial by the Son of Love, as the hymn writer said. I believe that was Fanny J. Crosby. But as he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. Now, the wonderful thing is that although this meant physical separation, it doesn't mean spiritual separation. That Hebrews 7, in discussing the heavenly priesthood of our Lord Jesus Christ, tells us in Hebrews 7.25 that he ever lives to make intercession for us. So the Lord has left the scene physically, but he is still praying for us. He has not forgotten us. And he is also still here spiritually, not only in the fact that he is omnipresent as God in his universe, but also that he has sent his spirit, who is called the Spirit of Christ. And the spirit given by the Lord Jesus Christ and given by the Father is in every believer. And so, as he promised in John 14, I will come and make my abode in you. The Father and I will come and make our abode in you, he said. And uh, every believer can say, we have the indwelling Christ. Like Paul, we can say in Galatians 2.20, the life I now live, uh, or, sorry, I am crucified with Christ, therefore I no, no longer live, but Christ lives in me, he says. And he goes on to say in that same verse, the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Also, when we gather together with God's people in the church, we can say the Lord is in the midst, as he says in Matthew 18.20, uh, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. They gather in the Lord's authority. And it, we see the Lord in Revelation chapters 1 through 3, walking in between the lampstands, the symbols of the local churches. So our Lord is still here with us. He's not left us. We've not been orphaned. And in fact, he's sent another comforter, another just like himself, one who is fully God, one who never fails, one who is all wise, one who is omnipotent, all powerful, one who is gracious and merciful, and one who applies the work of Christ and shows us the riches of the Father and the Son uh, that we now possess. And so even though he was parted from them, this wasn't the end of their relationship with the Lord. He's our head in heaven, and the church is still linked to him. And individually, we have access to him. We can approach the throne of grace at any moment, wherever we are, and we can come with confidence into that throne room and bring our petitions before the Lord and have the confidence that he hears and answers our prayers. Now, it's interesting that the gospel began with a priest who was unable to bless the people, Zacharias, because of his unbelief, because of his sin in not believing the word of God through the angel Gabriel, that messenger who came from heaven to give him the wonderful news of the birth of the forerunner of Messiah, John the Baptist, and of Messiah's coming. And because he didn't believe that, he couldn't go out and bless the people. He was chastened, or disciplined by God for his unbelief. He was a believer, and yet his faith had to be instructed. He had to be brought along. And so he couldn't speak until John was born. And then, of course, he blessed God and gave a wonderful message uh, about the Lord and what the Lord uh, had done at the end of Luke chapter 1. But here we see a high priest who is ready and willing and able to bless Unlike Zacharias, there's no sin in him. There's no failure. He's completed the work of God, and he's able to raise his hands in blessing and to bless them. And so accordingly, verse 52, and they worshiped him. So that's what the church is to do. We are to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the Bible is firm on the point that only God is worthy of worship. We are not to worship creatures. We are not to worship angels. Uh, Colossians 2 makes that point especially. We are not to worship any created thing and uh, only to worship God. So obviously this is an implicit statement of the church's belief in the deity of Christ. And it wasn't mistaken because our Lord many times when he was on earth received worship. And if you study Revelation chapters 4 and 5, he's still receiving worship in heaven. They worshiped him. And it says they returned to Jerusalem with great joy. 
And that's what comes from knowing the Lord. You have great joy. Even though your circumstances may be difficult, even though you may be persecuted, even though you have the same problems and difficulties that other people live living in this fallen sinful world have, nonetheless in Christ you have great joy. And we read, they were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. And so here's the end of Luke's testimony. It gives us a little preview of coming attractions, of what we'll see in the book of Acts, volume two of this great work, that they are going to be in the temple in those early days of the church, praising and blessing God, and also witnessing for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I trust these studies have been helpful to you, and I hope that you'll go back and read Luke extensively and study it for yourself. Uh, but may God encourage you as you look into his word, and I hope you'll tune in as well to see the studies on Acts that are upcoming. Uh, watch this space for those studies. Thank you very much. Farewell.